All right, good evening, everybody. Um, obviously, I'm not Pastor Jeff, but I'm here with you tonight anyways. Praise God. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jed Lindstrom. I'm the, the associate pastor here, and it's just a great pleasure and honor to be here with you tonight while Pastor Jeff and Monica are getting some much-needed R&R. Amen? You know, it's good to get refreshed, and it's good to be uh, just kind of away with, with those that you love. And so I'm glad that we're here. I'm glad that each and every one of you are here tonight, and I really believe that there's something um, special that God has for us. Amen? Amen. So um, how many of you are enjoying Sun Stand, the, the book Sun Stands Still? That's like a tongue twister, kind of. <laughs> Sun stands still. All right. I think we got it. Um, and I know last week there were, um, I know we've been getting just testimonies from people in their groups and also just people that have written us in about how this is really moving them to the next level. And so I'm excited about what God's going to release tonight. But I'm going to dive right into it because... There's a lot of material to go over in a short amount of time, and I don't want to shortchange you, all right? So, Father, we just, we love you and we thank you for giving us another uh, amazing day, Lord. We thank you that uh, three inches of snow didn't drop. Uh, some people are probably pretty bummed out about that, but, uh, but we just, we're so thankful for the fellowship that's here tonight. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you, we welcome your presence, God, and we just thank you so much for all the things that you're doing in our midst, and, and we honor you. We honor your presence, and we ask, God, that as we read this tonight, that you would reveal some things that would help to change our hearts, to change our lives, so that we would be the people that you have called us to be, people of purpose and people of faith, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. And so, um, you know, I'm a little bit, I, I feel a little bit energized tonight. I was able to get a, a, a jog in. I was able to press through and get 10 miles in. I was super excited. And I've, I've been pressing through. I started last week with 2.5, and then I went to 3, 3, 6. And then today I was running, and really I ran to a location. I really didn't know where I was. And so then I found myself a little further out than I wanted to be. So I, I was probably shooting for more like 6, but ended up running 10. Um, Praise God. So I'm, I'm energized and I'm ready. And I see that day five says and talks about seize the vision. Um, and I want to speak to that just for a moment because sometimes we have an idea, just like I'm sharing with you. I had this grand idea that I was going to go run a certain amount, but God had me run more. I ran more. I mean, I don't know if God had me do it or not, but I throw them in the mix because I like to, I like to run with them. It actually was interesting because, not to be all super spiritual, but as I was running, I, I found myself looking into each car as they were going by and just praying for the people that were going by. And, then, and I had this thought, it was this, how can my faith grow, how can my relationship with God grow and my love for people grow if I'm not praying for other people, right? Like, I mean, especially when no one else is around, See, a lot of people like to pray out in the front or they want to pray to get noticed. But the thing that I think that God blesses the most is when we pray when no one else is looking. Especially when you're praying for somebody else. You know, last night, if you were here, I was talking about uh, road rage. You know, a lot, of t a lot of people hop in their car with all the best intentions in the world, just driving to where they got to go until that one person pops off with a left turn right in front of you, and then all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose, right? And, 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 and so I think that our attitude can change when behind closed doors, that's why Jesus says, go behind into your closet, into your quiet place and pray. Because he knew that if he gave us more opportunities, or if we put ourselves in more opportunities to pray out in, in public, we would abuse it and it would destroy us. Because it's in those quiet times, it's in those times behind closed doors that God blesses those actions that we, that we do, that we, that we step out in, in faith. And so I found myself just praying, and really, that helps to change my perspective on other people. Because sometimes when I'm praying for somebody in a car, I'm, I'm, I'm getting outside of myself. And, and, and that is something that you can't plan when you say, I'm going to put my shoes on, I'm going to go for a run. For some reason, I, this is my way of kind of 
just clearing my mind, clearing my thoughts. And then God just fills my thoughts as I'm, as I'm going. And he just starts doing stuff that I wouldn't naturally do. But seizing the vision, we're going to talk about this because it's day five. All right? The point I'm trying to make has very little to do with me and my boys. It has everything to do with you and your vision. If you want to see God do something impossible in your life, you have to open your heart and mind to God's vision for your life. You have to seize it. See, there's a window of opportunity with every blessing that comes your way. When, whenever God gives vision, whenever he downloads something into your life, there's always an opportunity to seize that vision. And so when that opportunity comes, you can't miss it because you miss everything that's attached to it. Amen? And, and so it's, it's absolutely essential that when we see the vision of God for our life, we begin to seize that. And check this out. So Joshua has been a faithful second in command for many years. But talk about having a tough act to follow. And judging by the number of times, be strong and courageous shows up in Joshua 1. Apparently, God knows this leader is scared of failing. Don't waver or put it off. Or don't waver or put it off. Stop trying to have all the answers before launching out in faith. And I love this. All God needs is all you've got. Give it to him today. And, and I, um, I love that because, you know, a lot of us want to have all the answers or we want to have the, the really nice punch list of, here, I want you to do this, 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 and this, and that's going to result to this. But I'm telling you that when you walk by faith, it doesn't roll like that. It, it rarely rolls like, I mean, God operates in order and he, the Holy Spirit can give you a punch list. You follow it down the line and boom, this happened. But it typically doesn't happen the way that you think it's going to happen. And neither does the punch list. He'll, he'll mess around with you and have the thing you had on the bottom roll up to the top. It's just crazy how God works. But what he does is when you're all in, you just allow God to use you with everything that you have right now. You know, I'm going to use this run today because I, it was, I knew it was going to snow at some point. I got caught in the middle of the thick of whatever was coming down. And I just, I mean, I didn't have outdoor running gear, like the actual running gear. I mean, I had a pair of sweatpants and a sweatshirt and a hoodie, and, and I just went for it. And I'll tell you, my chest and my stomach was absolutely numb when I was about halfway through. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, I don't know if this is good. So I'm like running and I'm doing this. I'm like, I'm like trying to warm myself up. Not knowing if, like, something bad's going to happen. I don't know. I know nothing about the, what is that even, like, the flow of your body, whatever that is, like the, the yeah, getting hypothermia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to get that. So Joshua 1.5, <laughs> I don't want to get hypothermia, and I'm praying in Jesus' name I don't get hypothermia. With God, it doesn't matter who comes against you, Joshua 1.5. No one, say no one. no one, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. My friends, that's an amazing promise. That's a promise you can stand on. You can take that to the bank. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. And he said this, he says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And I, and I want to, I want to tell you, that's an absolute promise from God that no matter what you're going through, God is going to see you through it. Amen. He's going to stand with you and he calls you to stand with him because there ain't no one greater to stand with. He's amazing and he's good. All right. So day six, sanctified. Um, how do you say that? Naivete. Naivete? Okay. All right, we got that out of the way. I think I know why God gave me a bold vision for my life at such a young age. He had to get me before I was old enough to know any better. And I think that's just, that's amazing. You know, I had a lot of people tell me when I first gave my life to the Lord, and I was a, a lot, most of you know my testimony, I was a drug addict and a criminal and everything else. When I went to Bible school, I never even knew anything about the Bible at all. And I was doing stuff that was completely out of my comfort zone. 
and I started operating and stepping out in faith, and people would tell me, hey, I've been a Christian for 10 years, and I don't even step out in faith like that. And, I, I, and it wasn't like, it didn't puff me up, it just, it dawned on me that I'm, I'm just glad I didn't get full of a whole bunch of junk when I first got saved. I'm glad that I just stepped out in faith and just let God move. Because I already had enough junk on me as it was to work through. And so it's good. Um, but I'm glad that there's some things that we don't know any better. But you might have your own sanctified, and this gonna, they're going to keep doing this. How long is this one? Uh, naivety? Did I say that one? Naivety? All right. Nativity. No, just kidding. Naivety. <laughs> All right. You could be in any season of life. You might, get, you might be getting older and feeling as if you're running out of time. You might be young, as I was. You might be inexperienced. You might be poorly educated. You might be short on friends and funds, credentials and qualifications. From an objective standpoint, you might not look anything like heaven's pick for planting the impossible on the shores of the mundane. I think you, we can take a look around this room and, and, and we could all share our stories with one another and recognize that this is true. You know, if there was anyone that was, you know, I'm sure God could have chosen somebody a lot more qualified to be standing up here before you tonight. I'm sure that God could have chosen somebody with a lot more credentials than, you know, than you and I, but he chose us. Amen. And he's going to, and he's going to use us. And, it, and I think that that's absolutely amazing. The faith Jesus founded gained its popularity among nobodies, right? When we think about the congregations of the New Testament era, we have to think about the likes of everyday shopkeepers, day laborers, and stay-at-home moms. God planned it that way. God planned it that way so that no one may boast before him. And I want to say that I think that he planned it that way as well because God knows how to use a little and make a lot happen out of a little. So he knows that if he, if he uses the average everyday blacksmith, he uses the average everyday person working on the, in the storefront or in the, wherever, he knows he can get a lot more accomplished than just one person that thinks they're going to save the world. And God just don't operate that way. You know, he loves to use, he loves to use us for his kingdom and for his glory. And so I, I am absolutely in agreement with that. And, 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 and I think that it can be encouraging to you as well because maybe you're here tonight and you don't feel it. But God wants you to know that you are the one that he has chosen for the, this time that you're in right now. Maybe being naive and under-resourced isn't so bad after all. Sometimes godly enthusiasm makes up for a lack of experience. Sometimes spirit-filled determination compensates for a deficiency of knowledge. Sometimes sheer trust in God's vision trumps every reason why not. See, a lot of us get caught up in the why nots. Well, why not? Why not this? Why not that? Instead of just trusting that God spoke it and, and God revealed it and just going for it. 1 Corinthians 1.26. God calls you, then equips you for the task. And I love that, for the task. I mean, how much work do you think that there is to do? Is it a little or is it a lot? Is it overwhelming? You know what I mean? You know, what kind, of a weight, uh, what kind of weight do you carry? What kind of weight are you called to carry? And can you carry it with where you are right now? God's put people around you to help carry that load. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Think about that. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. I can say amen to that. Can I get an amen? Amen. How many of you were, uh, were not, were, were, how many of you were influential when God called you? How many of you were of noble birth? How many of you know what noble birth means? <laughs> noble birth. Okay. Day seven, give me, <coughs> day seven, give me my rocks. For days, none of Israel's fighting men have been willing to confront the Philistine giant Goliath. And I, want, I, want, I wanted to touch on that just for a second because we must be willing to confront the issues and battles before us wisely and boldly. Otherwise, they will trample on us. 
Those things that, are, that you're standing up against right now, if you just passively let it just stand there, it'll eventually run you over. Eventually it will. And, 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 and then David, a shepherd boy, volunteers. In my early days as a pastor, a consultant suggested that the people of Charlotte weren't going to relate very well to my preaching style. I was confrontational and abrasive. They wanted conversational and inviting. If I really wanted to grow a church, he said, dial it down. Maybe I should communicate my messages sitting on a stool instead of running around. Above all else, I should keep it short. If I preached over 30 minutes, they wouldn't come back. And he says, I tried that and it wasn't me. I'm going to keep rolling because I like this. Then one day I let loose. I love that. It's time to let loose, amen? I didn't bother with a stool. I pretended like the clock in the back of the room wasn't there. I preached with authority and energy, with passion and edge, loud and fast and long. Some would say I shucked the corn that day. I absolutely love that. But I bet, who knows? I mean, I don't know if he felt like he shucked the corn. But I guarantee that the feedback from what, what, what happened after he cut loose was amazing. I would, have, I would have loved to be there that day. I would have loved to be there that day. Um, and, uh, all right, whatever I did, it felt good. It felt authentic. For some reason, the people came back in greater numbers the next week. How many of you know that when you are authentic and you are yourself and you're open and transparent and you're in line with the will of God, you're doing the will of God, that, there, that people will be impacted even when you don't know it. Amen. See, you have to be encouraged by just the reality that you could potentially be impacting in, in helping somebody's life without you even knowing it. I think some of the greatest blessings in my life is when somebody comes up to me and says, you want to know what? Something that you said about a year back radically just totally changed my life. I love that. And see, that's what helps me go through the times when, 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 when I don't feel like anything is happening. How many of you have ever feel like nothing is happening at all? I want to tell you that just keep on plugging away. Keep on doing what you're doing and keep on doing good. And I guarantee you will reap a harvest. You'll reap a good harvest. That was when a liberating realization flashed inside of me. God has been preparing me all of my life for this. My anointing flows freely when I tap the vein of my unique abilities and my distinctive passion. Mediocrity, me, uh, mediocrity is mass produced. And I can absolutely attest to that. There's way too many people. I, I like to be around people that, that stir me up and that spur me on. I want to be around people that will challenge and will, will give constructive criticism and do some of those things because I know that those are the people that are going to uh, they're going to tell me the truth and they're going to do what I couldn't do myself. Amen. They're going to help me to get up to that next level. They're going to help me to stand out like God wants me to stand out. It's, it's, it's so easy to find someone that will tell you what you want to hear. It's so, and it's mass produced. Absolutely. Destiny is custom designed. I don't, have two, I don't have any like custom, custom suits, but at one time I did, I, I did have one. I did have one at one time. I wish I had more custom suits. That'd be kind of cool. Um, but there's something about a custom suit that fits you, and it fits you like no other. I mean, those, those lines are, that are just mass-produced, and we all wear mass-produced outfits, right? We're all probably wearing them right now. How many are wearing a custom-tailored Suit or outfit right now, raise your hand. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're among the norm. <laughs> but, but, but it's something about that custom fitting, and that's how God has designed our destiny to be custom fit. Right? All right. Um, where did it go here? For you to... Where's the cookie cutter at? Praise <laughs> you. The last, where is it? 
Oh yeah, you say he, he intends you to stand out? I lost my place. Day seven, last line. Oh my goodness, I can't even see it. Great am I. Oh yeah, 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 all right, good. All right, praise God. Cookie cutter Christianity dials down your distinctions. Audacity amplifies them. 1 Samuel 17, 30 and 39. I was looking at day, day eight. I have a little bit of a different one. Um, it's custom, it's tailored. I'm not used to it. No one can do you like you. Are we there? Yeah. It's time to be you. How many of you know this is the real me? <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm growing, all right? I'm doing it. Um, then, <laughs> some of you that know me know this is the real me. All right, that's good. You like that I'm a little bit slow, even though I'm really crazy fast sometimes? Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I am not used to them. So he took them off. You've never, you're never going to amount to half of what God has dreamed of you becoming unless you embrace the unique person God made you to be in the first place. place. I think too many of us try to put on other people's outfits and other people's fashions instead of just being who God has called us to be, instead of just putting on what we actually enjoy wearing. You ever try to put on a pair of shoes that somebody else wears and then you put them on and you realize you can't stand them? It's because there's other shoes that should fit, that are fit for you, all right? And I think that, you know, um, when, we, when we take a look at that, it's, 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 um, it's, So he took them off. It's a, you're never going to amount to half of what God has dreamed of you becoming unless you embrace the unique person God made you to be in the first place. He's made you on purpose for a purpose. You have a unique DNA with unique talents, passions, and experience that no one else on this earth has. And I think we get that, right? I think we get that. God did not create you to, to fit in. He intends you to stand out. You know, I think that... If, if we spend the majority of our life trying to fit in with other people's stuff, we'll never amount to the things that God has for us. I think that we get this message about we have unique talents and passions and experience uh, that no one else has on this earth. I think a lot of us have heard that and we get it, but we really don't get it. We haven't really received it or we haven't really had our eyes open to what it is. And so, it's be, and, I, and I believe this is the reason why, because... He intends for you and I to stand out. People get scared when they stand out because it's not the normal. It's not the normal. When you stand out, it's not the normal, and so you feel uncomfortable. You ever been in a crowd where you just feel like you don't fit in? Maybe you're here tonight, you don't feel like you fit in, but I, I guarantee that God intended it that way because he wants you to stand out, because he wants you to be used in a certain way. So that somebody can recognize you for who you really are. That's why you stand out differently. Because God's going to open up the eyes of somebody to see the talent and the gifting that you didn't even know existed. Day eight. I'm on track. God is bigger. Amen? In the car, this guy started screaming at me about how unbiblical I had been in the sermon I had just preached at the church. Amen. That's always a blessing. I had told a story in my sermon about how my dad had liver cancer and how we were praying that God would heal him. But even if my father wasn't healed, I'd, say, I'd, I'd said, we would still trust God. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Isaiah says, of course, Isaiah says, of course, we should pray boldly for what we think is best. That's at the heart of of the sun stand still experience. But let's have enough humility to realize that sometimes God's will is not going to be what we expect or when or how. What we have audacious faith for ultimately is God's plan 
and not ours. And I, and I think if I remember correctly in this story where he was, where he was talking about this and, and he was talking about, uh, he went into sharing something else about the time when he was, um, you know, there's a time when he began believing for it in, in the time that he knew that it, that it, you know, that it would actually happen. It, it wasn't necessary that, it wasn't necessarily um, in his initial thoughts that it was going to happen right now. And so this individual person was saying, well, you just, you don't have enough faith or something like that. Which I just think is absolutely crazy because what happens when you tell somebody that they don't have enough faith and the next day they got healed? Yeah. <laughs> right? What happens then? What happens when you tell somebody that they don't have enough faith and believe me because they're telling you that nothing happened, then you, you know what I mean? Like, what's that all about? How can we mark the timing of God on somebody else's healing? And how can we be the judge of how somebody is believing? How intense they're believing for it. I've been around people that have believed so intense. And my wife has an amazing testimony of this as well about when, we had a, uh, when she had a miscarriage. And, and how we believed. And it was, there was this message that was being preached about. you got to have faith. you got to believe for it. And we were believing we were going to go in there and we would see that baby. But there was no baby so does God not love us or love that kid because we had a miscarriage? Absolutely not. But the question still remains, why? I, can't, I couldn't explain that. My wife, we couldn't explain that to somebody. But, but then we feel kind of like bogged down because we didn't have enough faith to believe that there would be a kid back in there. I mean, that's just crazy. But it's not our plan, it's his. See, when we, we have, we've had four miscarriages. But here's the amazing thing. God blessed us with four amazing kids. Blessed her with four amazing kids that are not her own. So that's how God works when we step out in audacious faith. So don't tell me you know how and exactly when God's going to work that miracle because we just don't know. But I believe that he can do it now. But if he doesn't do it, he ain't any less God. And I ain't nothing. I am not less of a Christian and I don't have little faith. I continue to step out in faith as I believe you do as well. Isaiah 55, 9. Do you believe God's way is better than yours? Do you believe that? It's way better. I mean, just that word in itself, his ways. is... Are better. It's like the new covenant, the new covenant in the blood of Jesus is way better than the sacrificial system that was laid out in the Old Testament. That's what Hebrews talks about. This, this covenant in the blood of Jesus is way better than that old system that was, in, it was ineffective in comparison to what Jesus Christ has done. But if we really believe that God's way is better than ours, and it it helps us to think differently about our circumstances. It helps us to think differently. Because think about it. We often think that what we have right now is, you know, we, we, we hope things would get better. But if they got better, would we recognize that it was better? Would you recognize that it was actually better if it wasn't what you expected it to be? As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. His ways are so much higher. His thoughts are so much greater. That's why it's important to just let God fill your mind with his thoughts. Fill your heart with his heart. And just let him flood you every single day. It's amazing. Day nine. The, the, the perhaps paradox. The perhaps paradox. In today's reading, the army of King Saul has been locked in a standoff against the Philistines. And Jonathan, the king's son, has, be has become so aggravated with the inaction of his fellow warriors that he decides to make a bold move. He decides to make a bold move. Audacity is believing that God's promise is bigger than my perhaps. God's promise is bigger than my perhaps. The Bible says that God's word is a lamp unto our feet not a floodlight beaming to our destination. I think that really breaks it down because we would love to see everything all right now. 
But then what would your life look like if you already knew everything? It wouldn't really be a walk of faith. See, he says the just, those that have been justified by the blood of Jesus, those that have been justified and, and, and have been set apart for the kingdom of God, those of us, we, we, don't, we walk by faith, not by sight. So if we had a, a floodlight beaming and had everything illuminated for us, we would mess it up anyway. Right? We'd still go in the wrong direction. That's why I'm grateful for that, for, for that lamp upon my feet so I can, I can see clearly. I can see just enough in front of me to not mess it all up. Because I would totally mess it all up. He says this, so armed with the confidence that there's a decent chance and an interesting possibility that my impulse might be from God. Perhaps, in other words, I start investigating. Perhaps. Have you ever, have you ever responded to a, perhaps this may be the right thing? You ever go with your, with your initial gut feeling and been right? Yeah? I mean, I, I don't know how many times I knew I, knew I shouldn't have hesitated and to do something, didn't do it, and realized later I should have done it. You know? Um, I think that the first impulse, people, could, it, could it have been from God or not? But start investigating it. What, what does it look like to investigate it? I don't know. We all have a different way that we investigate stuff. We'd all like to live in a world where God let us do big things that require minimal risk. See, when you respond by faith or when you respond by having just enough information, just enough light to go forward, there's a lot of risk in that because you don't know what's going to come next. You might have an idea. You may have been briefed in on a mission, but I don't know how many of you were, are, have been and have served in the military, but I'm sure that when you went on mission, it, wasn't, it, it was probably just a little bit like what you were briefed in on. I mean, half the things that I do, I get briefed in on stuff, and we get moving, and it's like that wasn't anything like what we talked about on the whiteboard. Right? You probably know that for being, an, you know. I mean, if, I, I watched, that, I watched that, that Dallas SWAT, and, and, on that, and they had all this stuff mapped out. And it was like, wow. It's crazy how they have all this stuff mapped out, and it's like, wow, they were trying to pull that window off. The window didn't pull off, so they had to do something else. You know what I mean? So sometimes when you start investigating, you realize that you, you, gotta, you may have to do something that you weren't anticipating you would do. But sometimes it comes with a big risk. Most of the time it comes with a big risk. The fact is, the fact is though, that the land where the sun stands still is a land where promise and perhaps must coexist. Audacious, audacious faith does not eliminate doubt and fear. It eclipses their power one decision at a time. You know God's will by doing God's will. When you step out in faith and you start doing something, you know it's God's will because you're doing it. I was talking to a brother just before, the, before uh, we started tonight, and he was talking about he's taking care of his sister. And, 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 and you know, at one point, he wasn't capable of doing that. But now, he's capable of doing that. And you know what I said? I said, Brian, I said, guess what? You're stepping out in audacious faith, and you're doing the will of God. How do you know it's the will of God? You couldn't have done it before, but now you're doing it. And guess what? You inspire me. This is a room full of people that inspire me because you're doing the will of God. How do you know it? Because you're doing it. Don't underestimate what you're doing because those little things begin to build up. Please don't wait until you have 100% certainty to follow Jesus boldly. Jonathan and his armor bearer ended up saving the day in a spectacular way. Their act of audacious faith tilted the fate of an entire nation. Act on, on your perhaps and see what God will do in your world. 1 Samuel 4, 6. Are you standing still because of your doubt? Let's go across to the outpost of those pagans. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, perhaps, check that out, perhaps the Lord will help us for nothing can hinder the Lord. And he talked about this kind of being um, like, you know, talking out of two sides of his mouth. If you remember it, he says, help, he goes, perhaps the Lord will help us. 
Really? Are you going to roll with somebody who's like, perhaps this is going to be a good thing, but we'll check it out because God will go with us. Right? But here's a, here's, but nothing can, he knew that nothing could hinder the Lord. So he stepped out on this. Perhaps we can win a battle whether he has many, he can win a battle whether he has many warriors or just a few. It's not about the numbers. It's about the heart motive and the commitment of the people that are with you. Day 10, between the promise and the payoff, every big dream has a small beginning. Thank you. No exceptions. Let me say that again. Every big dream has a small beginning. No exceptions. Every tree was a seed once upon a time. The people who do big things for God are the ones who have the perspective to see the potential in these small beginnings. Can you see the potential in the small beginnings in where you are right now? Because here's, here's the reality. You may be doing big things, but you're still planting small seed. That's what I want to keep doing. Even when God has me doing big things, I still want to plant small seed. I still want to be scattering out there. You want to know why? Because I know how short my time on this earth is. And I know I want to make the best of every opportunity because the days we're living in, they're evil, they're short, but God is greater than the evil around us. God is much greater than the evil around us. They refuse to stop nurturing the seed until the dream is full grown. You can't just leave it there. I mean, you can plant the seed and you can trust God with it, but it takes nurturing at the same time until that dream is full grown. The ability to stay tuned in to what you've heard from God when you can't see any proof that it's coming to pass is what separates audacious faith from wishful thinking. Can God trust you with that seed? Can God trust you with the waiting and the process? Embrace the reality <coughs> that between the promise and the payoff, there's a, between the promise and the payoff, there's always a process. I had heard this one said that between the time where God releases the blessing from heaven and when it comes down to time. See, in, in, in heaven, there's no, it's, it's eternity. There's, there's no time in heaven. So between the time that the promise from heaven comes down to the time of earth, it enters into a whole new time zone. Think about it. See, the time zone of heaven is way different than the time zone that we're living in. And so we can see that this is, that what, what God has us waiting on right now is not in vain because it's big. And, it, and it, but there's a process that we must go through between those, the promise and the payoff when we actually see. Without the process, there is no progress. But the process is usually filled with pain. And if you don't know how to process the process, you probably won't make it to your promised land. That's why audacious faith is so vital. It redirects your attention from what is right now to what you believe will be one day. And it ensures that you don't give up in the meantime before you ever get to see your dream come to reality. You wanna, you, if, if you want to see this, trust me, you have to embrace the process, and I believe that in this, you have to submit to God. you got to submit to God through the... In, in the process, you have to submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. He will. It's amazing, all right? Do you have enough faith to stick with it? First Kings 18, 43 through 44. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times, Elijah said. Go back. The seventh time, the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. So you got to make a move before you get stopped. Day 11, mistaken to miracle. Nothing you've done is so repulsive. I, I, I love this. It's so repulsive that God can't redeem your potential and love you through it. But you have to face up to your wrongdoing before you can truly put it behind you. Get honest about your failure. Assess the damage your sin has caused. Stop making excuses. Don't even try to play off the pain. 
Too many of us try to play off the pain. It's amazing. Get it out into the open. If you've wronged someone, go to that person and seek forgiveness. If your sin is just between you and God, stop trying to hide it from him. And he knows about it anyway, so why would you do that, right? Just get real with him. And spend some serious time confessing your sin to him. God can't make anything miraculous out of your mistake if you don't call it what it is and deal with it accordingly. I think that speaks for itself. You have to repent of it to get released from it. I love that. You have to repent of it to get released from it. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Amen? Amen? I'll end with that. God bless you guys.